Oh shit, it's been a long time since you've seen that name, hasn't it? Welcome to the resurgence of pretend race cars. No two-hour live streams, no e-begging, and no 5,000-word articles this time around. I want you guys racing, not sitting around on YouTube. And to do that, we're just going to focus on reviewing cars and cars only. So how this is going to work is pretty simple. I don't like giving out scores, and I don't like talking about meaningless categories like sound or 3D model quality. They inflate the length of the video, and they're just not integral to the core on-track experience. Instead, I'm going to cover the three categories the hardcore guys actually care about. I'm going to start with any sort of quirks or oddities that you absolutely need to know about from a hardcore sim racer's perspective. Let's be honest, some devs or modders just miss the mark when making cars. They might be way too fast, they might traction roll, they might have a brutal default setup, or there might even be a professional driver complaining about them somewhere that you might have missed. This is the info you're going to get first and foremost. I'll then move on to the difficulty of the car. Is it a car you can jump in and be quick and right away? Is it a car that takes a bit of practice? Is it a car that you should generally stay away from until you've built up some experience driving other stuff uh, of a lower caliber? I'm going to talk about that. The final category will be the on-track product. Not everyone treats Sims as their own personal Chris Harris simulator. Some of us actually like to you know, go out and race. And there are a lot of instances where a car that's fun to throw around your favorite track instead results in a race where everyone's in their own zip code and the results are pretty lopsided. Or the cars are so aero dependent or setup dependent, you can't pass even when you've got to run on somebody just because the dirty air screws you over. It's stuff that actual racers care about, and we're going to make an effort to talk about it here. Finally, when all is said and done, we'll reach a verdict. Again, I don't like traditional scores. I want to stick with what sim racers actually know, which is basically one of three ratings. The first being Drive It Now, which is pretty self-explanatory, I think. This is a car that you should prioritize taking for a few laps and actually getting you know pretty familiar with. Uh, even if you're not into that particular racing discipline or series, just because that car is the best that sim racing or arcade racers have to offer. The second possible verdict, and the category most virtual cars are going to fall into, unfortunately, is filler content. This car might be worth driving once or twice just to check it out, but it's otherwise just going to not see a lot of action aside from hanging out in the vehicle roster car select menu. And, of course, the final verdict... A car that's missed the mark by so much, it's actually worth going on to the forums and just asking the dev what's up and if they're going to fix it sometime soon. Easy enough? Cool, let's get going. We're going to start things off with the 1991 Mazda 787B as it appears in Assetto Corsa. Of the three Group C cars featured as official Kunos content in AC, the 787B is by far the slowest, and if you run against either the 962C, the Sauber C9, or both, and there's no BOP enabled on the server, you're going to get destroyed. The 787B as a real-life race car is basically known for two things. One, it's sound. This is the only rotary-powered car on the grid in the World Sports Car Championship back in the early 90s, and two, it fluked into a Le Mans 24 Hours win in 1991 purely on reliability. This was never a car known for outright speed or track records. It merely fluked into a victory in the biggest endurance race in the world. Sim racers were generally first exposed to this car as a late game prize car in Gran Turismo 3. So it's kind of this cult phenomenon car as opposed to a car that was known for just being outright fast, but that's okay. So let's start with the quirks, and it's an important one in this case because it drastically changes how people will perceive the car. The default setup and the default values that Kunos bundled this car with set people up for failure. It is a disaster of a baseline setup, and numerous pages are just completely out of whack. Me and my buddy Tyler ran this car in a Sim Racing System Championship over the Christmas holidays a few months back, and one of the things we noticed when we started building setups for this car uh, is that everything from the camber to the differential to the suspension to the gearing was just flat out wrong. So let me see if I can rattle off some of the issues I had with the default setup here. Uh, first of all, uh, this is probably the most important one, the camber, it had like triple the amount of camber the car needed. Uh, camber Wizard, the app for a AC, told us we only re really needed about a degree of camber in the front end. Uh, the default setup comes with 3 degrees of camber. Uh, the differential settings, uh, I think the car had 65% power and 12 preload. It, it's just ridiculous when you get on the throttle, uh, the car wants to spin. The gear ratios, as you can adjust everything from 1st to 5th and then the final drive in this car, again, were way too short, which would kind of act uh, in tandem with the differential settings to just put you immediately at the top of the rev range and the rear end would just wander all over the place on you. It was really tough to control this car out of corners. And then finally, the spring rate was basically backwards. Uh, so by default, this car ships with, I think, 100 newton meter springs on the rear end. We were running 80 and their sway bar settings had a stiff bar in the front and a soft bar in the rear. We flipped them. So I think, uh, just going off memory, we lengthened the first and second gears. 
we completely flipped the differential settings around. I think we ran like 15 power and no preload and made coast some really high value so the car would be pretty neutral when you got off the throttle. We then softened the rear springs and made the front springs a bit stiffer so the car had some understeer built into it. And then to make the car cut into corners better, we softened the front bar and went max rear bar. And in doing all this, it made the car absolutely stick to the ground everywhere we went. It was comical. So a lot of races we'd do in the Sim Racing System Championship, we'd see guys just looping it off the corner or not really being able to go more than three or four laps without wrecking in practice. Uh, with this setup, we were pretty much flat-footed off the corner. Uh, even when the tires are worn, I know when I battled Ethan at Watkins Glen the first week, uh, I was practically sideways off the corner and just never thought twice about it. So if you tried this car in AC in the past and just couldn't jive with it and couldn't figure it out and found it was too twitchy, setup is 99% of your problem. I really don't know how a setup this twitchy uh, was the default package for this car. So that brings us to the overall difficulty of the 787B in AC. So with all the setup stuff being said, this car really falls into two different categories. If you drive this car with a default config or don't really make any changes or have some sort of theory on how to fix the car, yes, car is going to be super difficult. You're going to drive this once or twice around the Nürburgring in a public lobby. Uh, you're going to hit the ball a bunch of times. You're going to spin out. Uh, the car is going to feel like it doesn't stay under you, and you're never going to drive it again. With a more reasonable uh, setup applied, which is basically just a modern open wheel technique at this point, a super soft rear, uh, super super conservative differential settings, uh, completely transforms the car, and to me it felt like a mid-2000s FIA GT1 car in fast forward. It's kind of got the same properties as a Maserati MC12 GT1 on corner exit, but the mid-range torque and just the overall weight of the car being so much lighter, you start picking up speed that much faster. It's definitely a car that after some time spent running modern GT3s or, again, early 2000s FIA GT1, you could jump into without much in the way of issues. As for how it races, uh, results are kind of a mixed bag. Because the car is so setup dependent and not many people have figured out just the exact combination of settings to make this car feel really planted on corner exit, uh, races are really not that close. That being said, I was lucky enough we had some really decent guys drop in in both the North American time slot as well as the European time slot, and races among the front runners were really interesting. The way Kunos modeled these 90s slicks, they're not very peaky, so I noticed both at Watkins Glen as well as Monza, uh, you could really lay on the throttle off the corner and, and just have this giant slip angle going and easily hold on to the car, and you could continue doing this even deep into a race run. We would come out of uh, Parabolica at Monza and I'd be following a guy named James Leader and he would just be dead sideways off the corner and wouldn't lose speed and he would do this lap after lap after lap and nothing bad would happen. I also noticed at Watkins Glen I could do this too. Uh, when Ethan Dean was following me I could really just lay on the throttle and, and you know hold this big fat slide off the corner and go onto the rumble strips and it, it wouldn't lose any time. The other thing I noticed too is that while the car is definitely pitch sensitive and there's a sweet spot uh, in terms of the ride height both at tracks like Le Mans as well as you know more traditional circuits, the car isn't really aero sensitive. So if you get in someone's draft wake or you're just running in someone's dirty air, it really didn't fuck up your handling all that much. Personally, I think that's why people enjoy these 80s and 90s prototypes as opposed to modern stuff is that they're, you know, they're obviously aerodynamic, but dirty air doesn't ruin you. And especially early on in the season when we had a ton of people showing up for each race, uh, you could run right behind someone and it would not screw you over and you could duel with somebody uh, and you could get a run on them in the draft and when you go into the next corner you weren't scared that the nose is going to wash out. So in terms of racing quality, uh, great car, especially if you're in a room full of guys with near identical setups who have all figured out the car. Uh, at the front of the pack it actually produces really good racing, but if you're in a room where everyone's skill level is all over the place, uh, everyone's in their own zip code. So for my overall verdict of this car, uh, this is definitely a drive it now car. Uh, obviously there are some major, major issues with the default setup on Kunos's 787B, but I will say if you gave up on this car back when it was brand new, or it's one of those cars you tried it once just like in a Japanese pack public lobby, uh, definitely need to try it again. This is definitely a car that A, benefits from a really good setup, and B, produces really good racing where uh, dirty air does not play a huge factor. Uh, when trailing someone and the tires really let you get away with some crazy shit and really wheel the car off the corner uh, without just snapping and wrecking. If you've got AC installed, go give this car a spin.